Привіт! І вітаю тут «Take a Left» – «The Podcast from the Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament». I'm Helena Padelko, and today I'll be your host. I came from Kharkiv, it's east of Ukraine, and I have the pleasure to be doing the internship with socialists and democrats over the past few months here in European Parliament. Ukraine is entering the third year of full-scale war launched by the Russian aggressor. Russian troops are closing in on the capital. Live in Ukraine, a country at war. To unfold last night. Uh, in what you might call a worst-case scenario. I'm in a European Parliament, which was the first house of democracy that our President Zelensky addressed straight after the full-scale invasion. We are fighting just for our land and for our freedom, despite the fact that all life cities of our country are now blocked. Nobody is going to enter and intervene with our freedom. La guerra de Putin contra Ucrania marca el inicio de una nueva etapa en Europa y en el mundo. En tiempos históricos necesitamos decisiones históricas. Now, almost two years later, we're going to reflect on the war with Pedro Marques and Vladimir Chimoshevich, two S&D members of European Parliament. What has been done so far? And what else is needed to be done to help Ukraine? Why it's so important for Europe to support Ukraine? The resolution is adopted. Here with me in the studio is Pedro Marques, a Portuguese MEP and the vice president of the S&D Group. Hola, Pedro. Thanks for being with us and thank you for supporting Ukraine. Let's start with a personal question. Uh, do you remember where were you when the war broke out? Yes, I was actually in my country, uh, in Portugal, uh, with my family uh, those days. I mean, working from there, and uh, I remember looking at my kids and, 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 and seeing what the dangerous world was in front of our eyes from that moment onwards. It was quite impactful. I mean, of course, as you well recall, this crisis was unfolding for months. I mean, certainly since 2021, there was a lot of diplomatic work in which our political family was also involved here in, in Brussels and in, in Germany, etc., to try to to make sure that Putin would not invade Ukraine. But uh, so we, in a sense, we could see that the risk was there, mm-hmm. but it's completely different when it materializes. So it was, it was quite uh, dramatic to see that my world, my Europe, would change so much from that moment onwards. Was there anything that surprised you in a world's reaction? The surprise was really for Putin. Um, I guess he thought first from the Ukrainians. He was obviously not expecting the bravery of the Ukrainian people and the way how Zelensky and everybody said no to that aggression. Uh, because I think he, he was clearly thinking he would get to Kyiv in two or three days and he would take over the power there in two or three days, which was obviously not the case. Second, it was this unity of the of the West, uh, I mean, from Europe, but also from the West, this strong support. The fact that we managed to remain united in the sanctions, in supporting militarily Ukraine, I think that was his big surprise. What s and specific focus in their support to Ukraine? Yeah, for us it was, uh, at the beginning, there was a very, very specific question, a very important one, that for us was the first priority, aside, of course, from the military support and this political support, which was the situation of the Ukrainian people, the consequences to the people of that of that crisis, of that attack. So from the beginning, we were saying to the European Commission that all the economic support, financial support to the country that was needed was to be given so that the country could keep working and, and supporting the people in such a difficult situation. Mm-hmm. And then it was the situation of the refugees. For us, from the beginning, we said... There can't be one Ukrainian that needs our support here in Europe that we say no. So we said, let's, I mean, it's millions of Ukrainians, fine, we'll handle it. We'll be able to handle it. And we did. And it, it's indeed the case. It, were, it was millions of Ukrainians that needed our support in Europe. Of course, all the support to the people on the ground, because, as you know, there were millions of Ukrainians displaced also within Ukraine, right. from the east to the west. Right. And those had our support, were supported by Europe, and that was certainly a big, huge first priority to us. So the social situation of the Ukrainian people and the situation of the refugees, both here in Europe and there within Ukraine, that was certainly the most striking example of, of, of the differences or a priority, a specific priority to our political family. 
at the beginning, I mean. But with all that tremendous support that Europe gave to Ukraine and Ukrainians in Europe, uh, do you feel that approaching third year of full-scale war, uh, there is some kind of Ukraine's fatigue? What's obvious is that this this war is going on for long, and it's also unfortunately obvious that it's not to stop tomorrow. The European people have proved through these two years, they have proved even, I would say, surprisingly, because this, this, this conversation, this idea of a possible Ukraine fatigue, this has been there for at least one year. Uh, people were saying, no, through the winter, I mean, a year yeah. ago, uh, this will be so difficult in Europe because of the rising prices of energy, etc., that people will be tired of this war. But then the Europeans proved it wrong. And we maintained a strong support to Ukraine all through that winter and all through this year. And uh, for now, I guess, um, I don't see from the, from the people back home in Portugal or in other countries in which we are normally in our work as, as, as members of the parliament, I don't see that kind of feeling, people saying, no, we need to stop this, this has gone too far, we are, no, I haven't seen that. Even in the debates here in the parliament, there's, there's no, I, I don't see anybody still even daring to go that way, mm -hmm. which is not the case, for instance, in the US Congress. Right. We are seeing in the US Congress also for these internal political reasons, because of the, of the, the future uh, election for, for the president in, in this year, because of the fact that this is not in their country or in their borders and it's here in Europe, you can see in the US that, yes, you can perceive that there is a fatigue about the war and there is a political clash about the support to Ukraine, which means that for us here in Europe, it will be even more important in 2024, this year that is starting now, it's even more important that we do not leave Ukraine alone. We know that if President Trump is elected in the US, there's a risk that the Americans will, will start uh, letting go of Ukraine. This president is Trump. If he becomes a president again, I hope not, but if it would happen, we know that he wants to only focus on US matters and not, for instance, in, in a war like this, in the aggression of Putin. But we in Europe, we cannot leave Ukraine alone. So there is no room for Ukraine fatigue in Europe. Because in a sense, it's also existential for us. I mean, this is a war that is being fought in our borders, and it's a war against the European dream, against the European way. Putin wants to get back to the imperialism of a century ago, and he will not stop in Ukraine. Yeah. That's obvious. So it's us. We need to continue to support the Ukrainians because they are fighting for freedom, because they are fighting for Europe, but for our own interests. Because for me, it's inimaginable that Putin gets his way on rebuilding the old empire in which are today European nations like Ukraine or like the Baltic countries, just, just to give you some examples. Yeah, and as Putin said, Russia's border doesn't end anywhere. Uh, so it's actually incredible how, despite all tremendous efforts of Russian propaganda, uh, people in Portugal and uh, in other European countries are still remain united. But when you see your Portugal fellows, uh, how do you explain them why Europe needs still stand with Ukraine? Um, I guess that's probably one of the most striking um And, 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 and singular features of this situation is that the world has become much more global and the, the, the news, they circulate so fast that indeed the, the Portuguese people, they perceived when the invasion of Ukraine came, also because we had already an important Ukrainian community in our country for years now, but it's a, a bit in other countries in Europe, but the citizens perceived that war as a European war. And, and, and the invasion of Ukraine was perceived as an invasion of Europe. That was clearly the case. And that is the feeling I got in my country. It's not, okay, he's fighting some weird war far away. It was perceived, even in my country, that is in the other side of Europe, it was perceived as an aggression against Europe. And I guess that's one of the reasons, and not only in my country, but in general, I mean, in all southern countries, the support to Ukraine remains high. I think the citizens perceive this as an aggression to our way of living as Europeans. So that's probably the reason why the support remains so high. In our current uh, Ukrainian parliament, uh, Verkhovna Rada, there is no S&D sister party, and both of us know about that. That means there is no progressive parties that are ready to defend the same values shared here in the S&D group in European parliament. Uh, 
how can we build social democracy in Ukraine and what actually are you doing to that? Well, we are actually quite active uh, since the onset of the war. It's uh, it's been obvious to us that um, I mean, it's also part of the process now to 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 not let the social democrats in Ukraine feel that they are alone without the support in Europe, without a link in Europe. So we have it's indeed the the fact the case that now we don't have a, a sister party, I would say, a partner party in the in the Verovna Rada. We have been working with the Verovna Rada, of course, institutionally, but we have also been working politically with uh, important actors on the ground, namely the SD platform. They are our partners nowadays. They are mostly young people, a young generation that indeed feels social democratic, that wants progressive values to be also represented in the democracy in Ukraine. So we have been doing capacity building, we have been doing significant partnerships with the SD platform, and I guess we will do that more more and more when when the when the war comes to an end we will extend this kind of partnership all to the all through the country and uh, and uh, i mean we have as you know a program of traineeships work that come regularly here which also means capacity building that reinforces the ties of the SD platform, of the, S, S, the social democratic community of Ukraine towards the European Parliament and towards the European uh, political family. So I guess that won't stop. I mean, we, we, we will continue this work through the SD platform, through other platforms or NGOs of, 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 of civil society, of people that feel social democratic, that feel progressive. Those will find certainly, uh, I mean, a partner, a sister party, a sister organization in Europe to to work for. That's that's what our pledge and that's what I've been doing for, for these two years. Yeah. Obrigado, Dio Petro. Thank, Thank you. you so much for contributing your time and for standing with Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here I'm in a studio with Mr. Timoshevich, a former Prime Minister of Poland, a former Minister of Foreign Affairs and currently our main S&D negotiator on Ukraine and Russia. Dzień dobry, Mr. Cimoszewicz. Thank you for being with us. Good morning. (laughs) Good morning. Do you remember what was your first initial thoughts when you learned that the war had started? Of course, uh, as many people, I was surprised, uh, despite the fact that uh, I have followed uh, that concentration of Russian uh, army, armed forces uh, around Ukraine. I hoped that that was just a threat of use of force, uh, that... uh, Putin uh, wouldn't uh, move further, but unfortunately he did. Then, of course, I had still in mind um, the events of uh, 2014, uh, when uh, the first part of the Russian aggression against Ukraine took, uh, took place. And in that time, unfortunately, the Ukrainian army was totally unprepared to, to face and to defend uh, uh, the country. We, we all probably remember that uh, Crimea Peninsula uh, became under Russian occupation without a single shot. So I just wondered how the events will go this time. And um, on the third day of uh, Russian aggression, the uh, American president proposed to President Zelensky uh, to, to leave uh, Kiev, to take him with his uh, family abroad. And uh, Zelensky said that he needs munition uh, and not right. Uh, that was something great because um, it, uh, from the very beginning, uh, it, be, it was becoming surprisingly evident that Ukra- Ukrainians are very strongly determined and well prepared to defend uh, maybe not the uh, whole country, but uh, at least its heart, the capital, the Kiev. And uh, Russians were stopped, uh, Russian uh, panzer columns were uh, demolished by Ukrainians with that uh, another surprise, drones used uh, at massive uh, quantities. Uh, suddenly, a kind of hope uh, I felt uh, that maybe this time Ukrainians managed to, to make it. So, surprise, first because uh, I truly didn't expect uh, Putin to uh, to be so aggressive. Then surprised that Ukrainians proved to be able to defend themselves. And um, uh, then in a very short time in my country, we faced dozens of thousands uh, of Ukrainian migrants uh, looking for a safer place and uh, migrating, um, uh, first of all, to Poland. So those were my, let's say, reflections, emotions, impressions. Let's continue on the battlefield topic. You was talking about drones, and indeed drones were the game changer of this full-scale invasion. And we are entering actually the third year of 
Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Ukraine bravely resisted and continued to hold its line. But actually, some people even here in Brussels uh, say that counteroffensive maybe is not as spectacular and fast as a lot of people uh, expected it to be. And uh, despite some very successful, I would say, sea operation, drone operation. Are you worried that Ukraine's fatigue will take over? No, first of all, talking about the counteroffensive, of course, it was not a, let's say, complete failure uh, because Ukraine has achieved, uh, again, more than expected at Black Sea. Right. And uh, the fact that uh, they pushed away Russian fleet from uh, Crimea, from Sevastopol, uh, was very important. Uh, however, on land, counteroffensive, in fact, failed. Uh, that was despite the, despite the fact that Ukrainian soldiers uh, fought very bravely. I believe that the West made a mistake last winter uh, when uh, fights stopped and it was a time to supply Ukraine with larger uh, uh, quantities of munition, of new arms and so on, allowing Ukraine to attack Russians then, in right. that moment. Right. Unfortunately, for a couple of months, nothing happened uh, and Russians managed to uh, built all that uh, military Mine. defense infrastructure, uh, minefields, uh, and so on. And that made the counteroffensive uh, much more difficult. And there was a mistake also on the Ukrainian side. Uh, I would even dare to say that that was a mistake by President Zelensky. However, I understood uh, his situation very well. He, he wanted to give some hope to his people, but uh, by his narrative, he created such a strong impression that counter-offensive will change everything, that uh, in effect of counter-offensive, Ukraine will be able to regain control over all its territory. And that is why there was probably a lot of disappointment uh, in Ukraine, but also abroad. And today, uh, when um, we think about possible fatigue uh, uh, abroad, um, that, is what, that may be one of the reasons. Of course, another one is time passing by. Uh, some societies uh, may, may become a little bit tired, uh, may become less interested. Uh, there are, of course, some other international events like uh, what is going on in Gaza and Middle East, uh, uh, resulting in sharing the interests of, uh, of, the, of the public opinion in many countries and so on. But uh, it's my impression that uh, still, uh, especially here in Europe, uh, the majority of the people uh, understand the necessity of supporting, of continuing support for Ukraine. I would even say that uh, probably many ordinary people understand that better than some political leaders declaring uh, uh, solidarity and continuous support for, for Ukraine. You also mentioned about ton, millions of people who yeah. find themselves one day in the Poland uh, and uh, Polish people were very much welcoming to Ukrainians, which we very much appreciate. Uh, is support for Ukraine still high among Polish people? Yeah, it is. Uh, however, it is, of course, a little bit uh, different than in the first moments. In the first moments, uh, there was a kind of explosion of humanitarianism, of mm -hmm. human solidarity. Uh, again, I was surprised, I must say, very frankly, uh, because, uh, you know, Polish-Ukrainian history uh, was not easy, especially in last years. Uh, that was politicized, uh, mostly in Poland, however, also to some extent in Ukraine. And there was a surprise for me that ordinary people seeing on TV uh, those uh, enormous queues of Ukrainians waiting uh, at the border to, to be allowed to enter Poland, uh, opened their hearts, opened their homes, uh, offered uh, all possible um, support. But of course, uh, almost two years later, uh, there are quite many very practical uh, problems uh, that uh, require uh, more activity by the state and by international uh, institutions like the European Union. You know that uh, I don't know what is the percentage of uh, the cost of uh, assisting Ukrainian migrants in Poland. Uh, uh, but I think that almost 100% is being financed either by Polish state or just by the people, local self-government and so on. 
and uh, you know assisting uh, almost two million people saying uh, all the time in the country uh, is not an easy task but again many polls i believe that the majority are also matured enough to understand the logic of this war and the logic of the fight of ukrainians we understand that they are defending not only ukraine but they are defending a kind of post war post second world war order in europe so they are defending also us and uh, many people understand that it's very good to hear that uh, support among Polish people, not just on a governmental level, but on the level of uh, people, is still very high, and I'm very thankful about that. Uh, we already talk a lot in that house about the reconstruction of Ukraine. Yeah. What role can the EU play in that process? Can you talk about that a bit? First of all, I'm afraid that uh, it will take time, quite a lot of time, because the damage done to Ukraine is uh, huge. Many, many cities, including big ones like Mariupol, have been destroyed almost totally. Uh, I remember, you know, I was born after the, the, the war, the Second World War, but I still remember my country in ruins, uh, including Warsaw, the capital, uh, t- 10 years after the war and even more. So uh, I'm afraid it will take time. And of course, it will be enormous effort by uh, Ukrainian people, but uh, they they must be assisted. They must be assisted. Let's not forget that Ukraine uh, has been invited to start uh, accession negotiations to the European Union. And uh, it is uh, in the interest of all of us uh, to help Ukraine uh, to reconstruct, to rebuild it, even to make it better than it was before the aggression, to become a, a very valuable uh, new member of the European Union. country with unsolved basic uh, problems uh, will not be uh, that kind of new member. So Europe must be active. Uh, I have no doubt that Europe will uh, assist financially, that will offer, of course, uh, technical assistance as well. And uh, have no doubt that many European companies, uh, construction companies, other companies, uh, will be ready to, to go to Ukraine and, uh, and to work there, to help there. But uh, I must say that I would expect from Europe uh, to play even more important role as a kind of international global coordinator of support for Ukraine, because uh, coordination will become very important, Uh, not to waste uh, effort, not to waste money, uh, to be very effective, uh, to cooperate very closely and directly with Ukrainian authorities at all the levels, etc., etc. So Europe uh, should think already now about its exceptionally active role in that process. And continue talking about money for reconstruction. Let's touch on that topic uh, on confiscate uh, Russian state assets that uh, is frozen by sanction. Uh, and actually using that money for the reconstruction of Ukraine, the topic was widely discussed uh, here in the House. And S&D and you particularly have been very active and vocal on that. Uh, it's about two, 200 billion euros of Russian money and assets that have been frozen for a while in Europe. Uh, why don't we simply use it? And uh, isn't it only fair those who are destroying Ukraine uh, could pay for it? Uh, as, as you know, uh, Russian state as well as private assets um, are located uh, in many democratic Western countries were frozen. As you said uh, yourself, uh, 200 billion or even more than 200 billion euros uh, uh, have been frozen in Europe uh, of state state owned uh, assets if i'm right uh, uh, the figure uh, of private uh, frozen assets is at the level of 26 billion i believe euros um, um, the decision about freezing uh, the, 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 those money was understandable however as a lawyer I think that um, confiscating private uh, Russian money will be much more difficult if uh, we are not able to present evidence showing that uh, that, can, uh, that money was uh, some way earned because of the war, because of supporting, equipping Russian army, etc., etc. Otherwise, the, the, the owners of those frozen money may win uh, in, in the courts, mm-hmm. uh, in, our, in our countries. 
Yeah. Uh, we respect the rule of law, and that, yes. that will be the consequence of that. The different uh, case situation is with uh, state uh, money mm -hmm. belonging to the Russian state or to, to Russian central bank. Mm -hmm. uh, before the aggression, uh, that over to 200 billion were located in different places in Europe, uh, and. Um, a Belgian uh, company which uh, specializes in transferring money from one place to another, uh, Euroclear, I believe they, they are, they is their name, uh, suddenly became uh, uh, that institution where, according to the decisions by Russian Central Bank, all of the money were concentrated. Mm -hmm. I understand that the intention of Russians was then to transfer everything to Russia. But in that moment, that money was frozen by the decisions of the European Union. And uh, they are here. They are being controlled uh, here in Brussels by Belgian uh, company. The problem is that from the very beginning, uh, many governments, uh, as well as some international institutes like European Central Bank, uh, were very, very negatively uh, thinking or uh, commenting uh, uh, on the idea of confiscating that money. Mm -hmm. And they've been raising uh, some legal, I would say pseudo-legal arguments, saying, speaking about uh, state immunity, etc., mm -hmm. uh, etc. Et I have absolutely no doubt, like many experts, uh, there are many, many uh, opinions already elaborated by international experts. I have no doubt that uh, using uh, one of two ways uh, allowed by the international law, so-called countermeasures or collective self-defense, allows us to confiscate that money. There is no political will. I'm afraid that we are uh, still facing a very strong opposition, but one day it will become a kind of must option. Why? Two weeks ago, for the first time, the White House declared that they are supporting confiscation of Russian yeah. state uh, assets. Uh, so I think that what we can expect will be a strong push by Americans. Uh, and I hope that they, they will be convincing enough uh, to make some European governments to change uh, their mind in that regard. Let's hope that we will move forward soon yeah. on that particular issue. And uh, maybe you obviously know that Canada was the first country who used uh, private uh, assets for Ukraine reconstruction. And I really hope that is a good electional point before the uh, European election, which is upcoming this uh, summer. Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, because I expect that uh, uh, xenophobic nationalistic parties uh, in Europe that in general are growing in, in yeah, power... Right. Uh, will be against continuing um, that kind of, that level of support for mm -hmm. Ukraine, using that argument that, oh, we have our own needs, our own problems to be solved, we cannot uh, yeah. uh, spend so much uh, of our money. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, if, um, for instance, the left, if SND uh, shows uh, the solution uh, by using the money belonging to an aggressor yeah. to support a victim, that may be uh, liked uh, by ordinary uh, Europeans. Okay, and let's uh, finish with uh, one of the most important questions for Ukrainians too. Uh, we're here in the European Parliament and uh, when we're going to welcome our Ukrainian MEPs here and uh, when Ukraine will finally be able to become a full member of European Union? We use uh, the example of, of my country. Uh, we, we became full-fledged member 13, 14 years after application and um, six years after starting negotiations. But of course, we were in much easier situation than Ukraine is and will be in the future. We were not in war. We could focus our efforts just solely on uh, pre preparing Poland uh, for negotiations and for membership. Uh, so um, I would say that... Uh, Ukraine can, of course, expect a, a very strong political support, uh, but uh, Ukraine must fulfill all of the conditions and criteria. And with all of the progress uh, noticed in Ukraine in last years, uh, uh, it will take time. I think that uh, if Ukraine becomes uh, uh, the member of EU in that decade, mm -hmm. so uh, before 2030, it will be good.
we should be realistic and uh, I, I'm afraid it would be, it can be a kind of uh, cruel narrative uh, in the present uh, dramatic situation of Ukraine to make empty promises. I agree. But let's be optimistic and do our best yeah, sure. to make it happen. Thank you very much and thank you so much for being with us today and thank you for your support to Ukraine. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. What is the solution? The solution is adopted.